You know, it's easy to get lost in a sea of information that's presented to us today. So how do we differentiate the different viewpoints that are being thrown at us on a daily basis? Well, in this episode of Church Help Desk, Jim Dennison will teach us how to discern a Christian viewpoint out of today's news. So in the year 2000, I was doing some journaling over Christmas, and I thought, you know, I could turn this into a devotional we could send out by email, which back in 2000 was not something everybody was doing. So we, I was pastoring a church at the time, and we asked people if they'd like to do that, and some people said yes, so it was just that. Just a devotional that we sent out each day. It was actually a Word document attached to an email. And then when I started what we're doing now 11 years ago, by that time, I turned it into a cultural analysis based on news, but not necessarily the day's news so much. You know, we had about 7,000 subscribers at that time. And over the years, it's just kind of morphed into what it is now. We have about 200,000 subscribers now in 203 countries, if you can imagine. I talked not too long ago to a guy that uh, has a friend in the, what is it? It is the uh, Swiss embassy in South, no, the South African embassy in Iran who reads the article and he says it helps him understand Muslim thinking better, which is kind of cool. So um, I write kind of a rough draft the day before and then I get up early in the morning and start over based on the news or rewrite it based on the news and then we get it out by about six. And there's a podcast. We have a professional voice that records them. I have some vocal challenges. So I have a professional uh, voice that records it as a podcast as well. And uh, yeah, it's about 200,000 people. And then I do a lot of writing for Facebook and Instagram posts as well. And the total reaches about 1.2 million when you put all that together. And the way to get to that is denisonforum.org is the website. It's got all that on it. Mm-hmm. And it's all free. It's a donor-based thing, so it's all free. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, you bet. Yeah. One of the things I was asked to talk about a little bit is a question I get asked all the time. It's a real issue, is how do you deal with the news in a culture that seems so partisan? Where do you trust? What objective source can you go to? Who can you follow? What can you read? How do you trust what you read? How, how does this work in a culture that seems more polarized than ever? The reason it seems that way is that in some ways it is. Now, you don't want to get that out of historic context. We have been more polarized during the Civil War era than we are right now, right? But at least in recent decades, I mean, we're at a place now where like a third of Democrats say that they don't want their kids to date a Republican. And more than a third of Republicans say they don't want their kids to date a Democrat. That's how polarized we are. We're at a place where there's this idea, a significant percentage on both sides, says the other side is the major problem with America. It's just their existence. That's how polarized the culture is. And so you're seeing that reflected in the various news sources that are out there. And people ask, well, who do I trust? What do I read? Everything seems so opinionated and and so driven and all that. So we'll talk about that for just a minute. And then we'll kind of jump over to whatever would make sense you'd like to do here. The answer to the question is people asking me, what's the objective news source? It doesn't exist. And here's why it doesn't exist. I don't mean this to be unkind. Media is a business, right? It's in business to make money. They have to make money to stay in business. There was a day when you made money, you got, and you make money by advertising primarily. You get it through subscribers as well, subscribers, but a lot through advertising. There was a day when you got more subscribers and more advertisers if your reputation was that you were objective. You may never have heard a guy named Walter Cronkite, but he was known as the most trusted man in America. And every night he'd end the CVS evening news by saying that's the way it is, and everybody just assumed that that was right. And that kind of objectivity is how they made money. All right. In the last 20 years or so, as partisan issues, a whole other subject, part of what we talked about earlier, have become such a thing, now we're to a place where there are these very discrete, discrete demographics. And uh, manufacturers, companies, know who they want to market to. And so they want to find a media bridge that gets to the audience they're trying to sell to within that very specific demographic. And the analytics are crazy with how specific they are these days. Some of the Cambridge Analytica stuff, I mean, it's really frightening how much they know about you based on your Facebook patterns or what you buy online or whatnot. They know more about you than you know about yourself in some ways. It's pretty crazy how much they can know about you as an individual, including your buying habits. And so what's grown up is media sources that focus on specific demographics so that advertisers will use that as a bridge to sell to that demographic. So to be specific, Fox News knows exactly who they're trying to reach, as opposed to MSNBC. And they make money by being that partisan, as you could call it, in their focus, because that's what attracts the demographic that their advertisers are trying to reach. 
So you make money today in the media by being focused on specific agendas, specific audiences, specific growth t targets, and all that's inside that. That's just how the business works today. There is no such thing that I'm aware of as an objective news source, and if you target one today, I don't know how you'd make money at it. That's just not how it works. So what you want to do is be aware of the biases, be aware of the agendas behind the various outlets, the various platforms, and then consume news from a variety of different perspectives to get closer to something that you can trust as being on some level objective. So if you're following a source on Fox, you want to also look at it on CNN. If you're looking at something on MSNBC, then you might want to look over at uh, Real Clear. You might want to look at The Blaze even or something like that. And you want to look at various perspectives to kind of get a sense of that. It's kind of like biblical translation. You've got extremely literal translations like the New American Standard, and you've got paraphrases like the message, and you've got stuff in the middle like the NIV. The ESV is kind of halfway between the dynamic equivalent and the literal. And so you have these various translations that all have their own theory. And reading from several is the best way ultimately to get at the text. That's the way I would suggest that we understand news these days. One last thing I'll say is to challenge yourself by listening regularly to sources with which you disagree. The echo chamber of the day is a huge problem. The people only listening to sources with which they already agree is just reinforcing stereotypes, reinforcing agendas, reinforcing narratives that are driving us further apart rather than closer together. And so I try regularly to follow writers with whom I vehemently disagree because they teach me every time. And they, at least if they do nothing else, show me their perspective more effectively. If you can afford a subscription to the New York Times, I would urge you to do that. And if you do, then you want to read everything David Brooks writes. When I grow up, I'm going to be David Brooks someday, I hope. I'm a huge fan of David Brooks for the most part. I disagree with some things. But while you're there, you also want to read Frank Bruni. Even though you're going to, if you're an evangelical Christian, you're going to disagree with pretty much everything he writes. And you want to read Paul Krugman, even though I guarantee you, you'll disagree with what he writes. Because he's expressing such a huge percentage of the population that we're trying to reach. And because he helps us to understand ourselves better. And so pay attention to the people that disagree as a means of building bridges and understanding their perspective. Long story short, you want to be getting from a variety of places and especially people with whom you disagree. That would be the way I would look at that. Let me get to one other thing I wanted to get to at the earlier session, didn't get a chance. I am convinced that God redeems all he allows. Because God is sovereign, he must allow or cause all that happens, right? Jesus said that sparrow doesn't fall from the ground apart from your father's knowledge. God knew I'd be standing here right now with this mic in my hand. God causes or allows all that happens. God is holy and can never make a mistake, right? God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Not just that God loves, God is love. And so because God is sovereign and he can never make a mistake and he is love, I'm convinced he therefore must, his character requires him to redeem for greater good, everything he allows or causes. Now, I'm not saying that I'll understand that this side of heaven. I don't understand the airplane I'm getting ready to go get on. If I'm too heavy to fly, why is it it too heavy to fly, you know? I'm not saying I'll see that before heaven. I'm not saying I'll understand that. We look through a glass darkly, but one day face to face, and one day we'll know even as we're known. But I'm convinced that it's true. My father had his first heart attack when I was two and died when I was a senior in college. I miss him every day. My greatest tragedy is that my father never met my sons. I can't give you enough good to outweigh the bad of my father's death in my mind, in my experience. But I stand here convinced that God is redeeming my father's death for a greater good. Or he wouldn't have allowed it. And I would drive all of that to the coronavirus we talked about earlier. And I'd be suggesting, not that God caused it, but that God wants to redeem it and one of the ways maybe one of the most significant ways to redeem it is to encourage and empower and challenge you to use the coming weeks in a way that could make an eternal difference in the lives of the people you care about. Because God redeems all that he allows. I'm convinced of that. And I just wanted to share that with you as a word that sustains me every day. My oldest son went through cancer eight years ago. And uh, he's okay now although his cancer comes back 50% of the time. He gets an MRI every spring. Uh, he didn't get a five-year cure. And uh, next to my father's death, that's, of course, the hardest thing I've ever been through. But I hold on to the fact that God is redeeming. 
has redeemed and is redeeming and will redeem for greater good. And that has been incredibly encouraging to me. I wanted to share that this morning. I didn't have time to do it. So I wanted to say that relative to the things of the news, whether it's coronavirus or something else. How could God redeem the biases of the culture? How could God redeem the partisan election we're about to have? How could God redeem whatever's out there? That's the question we want to be asking. And how can I be part of that? So anyway, so that's my little sermon. Then we'll take an offering and have an invitation. And, you know, it is a Baptist church after all, right? So, you know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. So we're going to make this easy. Uh, and I'm going to move this microphone a little bit back. It was kind of close. It was almost like it was coming. Yeah, we're going to take it. I'm going to put it right here. I don't want you to be shy. So if you have a question to ask, I want you to think about that and go ahead and get that way. If, if you don't come this way, we're going to take the mics off the stands and we're going to send people into the audience, right? That'll be fun. Uh, and so then we'll Jerry Springer. You know? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Denson, yes. I am uh, currently in an AP European history class, and uh, one of my classmates in that class is a Marxist, yeah. and we were having a discussion over the concept of objective morality um, and whether or not it truly exists, I, of course, being on the side of that it does exist you know, through, through divine nature and he being on the side that it, it doesn't exist. And he, he said something that I, I didn't have to really know how to combat at the time. I was hoping you would... Um, I mean, with, with a background in uh, philosophy and stuff like that. Um, he said that uh, rules are there for like the, pr like, sorry, the structure of society. So if somebody robs a bank, it costs more money in his, this is what he said. I don't know if I necessarily believe this. If somebody robs a bank, it costs more money to dispatch the police to stop that criminal than it did for him to rob the bank. They just do that so society doesn't get crazy and we don't have anarchy. Uh, what, would, what would be your response to that? That's a great question. And it's interesting that a Marxist would be saying this. That's really a kind of an interesting cultural collision, I would say, on some levels. Uh, Marxism, as all of you would know, and I don't know the degree to which you have come across this, it's really resurgent these days, comes out of a thing called the Hegelian dialectic, which says there's truth, um, or synthesis, antithesis, and the result is a synthesis, and that becomes class struggles and all of that. They've got rules for all of that, that's what I'm saying. They've got really strong kind of understandings of how culture moves and how it doesn't, how understanding, how truth is understood and all of that. And so for him to say there's no such thing as rules out of a Marxist background is really kind of interesting to me. But I'd make a couple of comments in response and they'd both be more uh, larger than even to that specific question, great question. First of all, for me to tell you there's no such thing as truth is to make an absolute truth claim, right? There's no, there's no such thing as truth and we're sure of it. You know, which is not a new concept, by the way. There was a philo philosophical movement called the skeptics three centuries before Christ that made that exact same claim 2,300 years ago, that same idea. No such thing as truth, and I'm sure of it. To say that no such thing as rules is to make a rule. I'm making a rule that we have no rules. I want a culture, I want to, I want to make a rule that we don't try to arrest bank robbers because if we do, we're going to spend more time and money arresting them than we are and try and then the money that they stole. Well, let's make a rule for that. Let's make a rule to have no rules, you know? So one piece inside this is to demonstrate the inconsistency, at least, of the postmodern relativistic claim that there's no such thing as truth. The second thing to do is to demonstrate the fact that rules are culturally conditioned. There are some bank robberies for which what they steal is so much more valuable than what it takes to find them and to get it back, that his argument is fallacious. If you talked about art theft, for instance, uh, when someone stole the Mona Lisa back some years ago, I mean, it was considered priceless, but there certainly was no amount of money that the French authorities wouldn't spend to get it back. 
in the belief that it was more valuable than whatever it cost to get it back. Maybe a local bank robbie would fit his illustration, but to make uh, a transcendent statement that morality can't exist based on specific examples for which it might not be as defensible is to make a category mistake in philosophy. It's like asking how much does seven weigh or what color is three? It's saying I'm gonna make transcendent truth claims based on limited specific analogies and illustrations when it's transcendent being illustrated by imminent and those are two different things. I don't know if that makes sense or not. He's making a claim based on a one-off when I could offer him all sorts of counter evidence if I wanted to from the Mona Lisa down to theft of intellectual property that can be worth billions of dollars and so forth for which to say that we're expending too much effort just to get it back is obviously not the case. So he's making a transcendent claim based on a specific illustration and that's a philosophy mistake. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah, very good. <laughs> I'm too short for this stand. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm too short for this oh, stand. Oh, there you go. There we go. Thanks. I'm in a Western Civ 2 cl two oh. class in my college, and my teacher is basically trying to prove that the Hebrew Bible is, fa is historically inaccurate throughout his entire s lectures. I'm sorry. And so my question is, with the rise of confirmation bias, mm -hmm. how do we discern what is truth and what isn't? Great question. With the rise of confirmation bias, how do you discern truth from non-truth, right? Uh, I'm going to come in saying, I believe the Hebrew Bible is true because it's the Hebrew Bible. Is this not circular reasoning? Same thing a Muslim would say about the Quran. The same thing a Mormon would say about the Book of Mormon. The same thing a secularist can say about whatever their truth claim might be. Stephen Gould's work on evolution or whatever it is. To say that t confirmation bias exists doesn't mean it therefore disallows any truth claim because I just made a truth claim right? What you want to do is be aware of it, admit the possibility of it, and then look for evidence or argument to the contrary. He has a confirmation bias, I would allege, that the Hebrew Bible is not trustworthy from a scientific perspective. Could we have a conversation that could consider counter evidence? Could we look at archaeological finds? Could we, could I take him to Israel with me and I could show him the palace of David, which has been identified beyond question? Could I show him a recent discovery demonstrating, I saw it at the Israel Museum last time I was there, demonstrating the existence of David based on our archaeological uh, transcription evidence? Could we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls? and the incredible accuracy with which the Masoretic text was copied for a thousand years from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the oldest manuscripts we had before 1947. Could we talk about Messianic prophecies fulfilled, 48 prof uh, Old Testament Messianic prophecies fulfilled by Jesus? Mathematician Peter Stoner calculated the odds of fulfilling eight of those. He picked eight of them, were one in 10 to the 17th power. To get to that illustrated, you'd have to fill the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars put a dot on one of them, lead me around blindfolded for the day. I reach down and pick up a silver dollar and the chance I pick up the one you marked is the chance of Jesus fulfilling eight of the 48 prophecies he fulfilled. The chances of, of his fulfilling all 48 are one in 10 to the 157th power, which is larger than the number of electrons in the universe. So if we're looking for the validity of the Hebrew Bible, could we consider counter evidence would be what I'd be saying. I'm not ex exercising a confirmation bias if I'm willing to consider both sides of the discussion. Now, if I'm only willing to consider evidence that moves in my direction, then of course, I can be accused of this. But I would just say to a professor who wants to call you on confirmation bias for believing the Bible's the word of God, if you have evidential reasons for doing so, and if you're willing to consider contrary evidence, and he's willing to do the same, then we've moved past confirmation bias as an issue. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. Yeah. It's a, uh, where would you go with this? Um, trying to think of some source material that's been out. I mean, you know, the old classic stuff is Josh McDowell's, you know, Evidence, Man's Verdict, and, and the stuff inside that. In more recent times, uh, Walter Brueggemann's done some good work in the space. Uh, there's been some, BAR actually, a Biblical Archaeological Review, has some really interesting studies about the David inscription that was recently discovered and what's being done with, uh, with the terraces around David's, uh, uh, around David's mansion, as they call it. So, yeah. Now, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah. 
Do these people get two lunches if they come stand in line? Yeah. Is that how that works? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, very good. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I've been trying to figure out how I want to word this question. Um, so um, in your lecture, whenever you started off, you um, talked about the, the path to truth philosophy, right? Which is the truth mm. is subjective because my truth can't be your truth. Yeah, that's the claim. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess m my question is, um, could there potentially be a biblical foundation in that um, philosophy? Mm -hmm. um, in that we all have our own personal relationships with God, so therefore my truth can't be your truth. Right. Um, but that philosophy has kind of been corrupted to fit these um, cultural meta narratives. Um, but I guess that's my question is if it can, um, and, but if not, like what is the opposing philosophy? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, that's uh, some things. Had we more time up earlier, we could have gotten into because they're really some things. So first of all, if I come along as Kant and I say that you can't know the thing in itself, all right? I can know what the microphone looks like, sounds like, tastes like, feels like, but I can't know the thing in itself. I want to come back and say, okay, what's the thing in itself you can't know? If I know what the microphone looks like, sounds like, tastes like, feels like, what can't I know? He's actually making this assertion based on what's known as German idealism, which we won't get into, but it's a platonic idea and it suggests there's an idea outside of the experience. And none of that can be demonstrated even by his own argument. So I think the idea that you can't know truth, first of all, it's contradictory, it's a truth claim. To say you can't know objective truth is to make an objective truth claim, and there's an objectivity to reality that absolutely can be known. Now what you want to do if you're a scientist is come along and admit you want other people to replicate your experiments because you can make mistakes. Obviously you can. You want to admit that you're not omniscient about this. But to say you can't know truth is an idea that gets kind of, kind of um, confined to the, uh, to the world of philosophy, but it should also be applied to the world of science, in which case we have no science. It should be applied to the world of mathematics, in which case we have no mathematics. Clearly, scientists believe in objective truth. Clearly, scientists believe that two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen makes water every single time. That's an objective truth claim, right? And so we, first of all, want to push back to the idea that there can't be objective truth. But the second thing we want to do, and it moves exactly to your point, is we want to redeem this. We want to turn this from the adversarial to the opportunity. One of the many ways that postmodern relativism is being used by God, I think, is to give us a valid critique of the modernistic, objectively-centered, legalistic, doctrinal Christianity that placed very little emphasis on personal experience. That just kind of said, Christianity is showing up on Sunday. That's what Kierkegaard was working against, was the cold, dead Danish orthodoxy of his day. And what the postmodern emphasis on individual truth really gives us is a chance to do what you just said. Well, you're exactly right in that nobody can have your experience. Let me encourage you to have an experience with God that will be uniquely yours. When I was doing that debate or that discussion with Christopher Hitchens, the point I wanted to make was this. Relationships cannot be proven, only experienced. All relationships require a commitment which transcends the evidence and becomes self-validating. All relationships require a commitment which transcends the evidence and becomes self-validating. If I was looking to prove to my wife that she should marry me, she'd have never married me, trust me. Even today, she'd never married me. If she was waiting for me to prove that I'd be a good father, we'd have never had kids. Now you examine the evidence, of course you do. But then you have to step beyond it. You couldn't prove this was worth your day to be here. You had to examine the evidence. You had to see if this thing made sense, if it looked like it was a good thing to do. But you couldn't really know until you did that. All relationships work that way. So to ask for objective proof of a relational experience is like asking how much does seven weigh or what color is three. And that's the point you want to be making with your friend. Now there is objective evidence here I want to tell you. This isn't a leap into the dark, it's a leap into the light. 
If you want, we can talk about archaeological evidence or uh, manuscript evidence or internal consistency or fulfillment of prophecy. There's all sorts of apologetic evidence we can have a conversation about. But then you step beyond the evidence into the personal relationship, and that's the point you're making. And that's ultimately where you want to go with this. One of the things Josh McDowell has done over the years when he's talking to a skeptic is asked, if I answered all your questions, would you then become a Christian? I've never had someone say yes. And what that says to me is the questions, while they may be legitimate questions, really aren't the issue. Behind that is the issue of the will. And that's where you want to go. And that's, that's your point. It's a terrific point. At the end of the day, we want to lead them to a personal experience because that's what salvation is, right? It's not a sent to proposition. It's a personal experience. Yeah, thanks. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. First of all, Dr. Jensen, thank you for coming to Arkansas. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. My uh, wife's parents lived in Mountain Home, Arkansas for a lot of years. And fishing for trout on the White River is kind of my favorite thing to do. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You got to understand, I grew up in Houston. The only hills we have are freeway overpasses, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, the mosquitoes, the state bird of Houston, you know? And so to be in Arkansas, any chance I get to be in Arkansas, you know, it's just a fantastic place and really glad to be here. Thank yeah. you. Um, I'm an assistant pastor in Hot Springs, and I'm also mm -hmm. a student at Southern Seminary. Terrific. And I'm really struggling with the determinism, uh, compatibilism, libertarian free will debate. Um, all of my teachers at Southern are determinist or compatibilist, and um, I'm just not buying into a lot of it. So my question's related to that. Um, earlier you said that he redeems all he allows, and then you said that you don't completely understand it. Mm -hmm. We see through a glass darkly. Right. But you said that you are convinced that it's true. Mm -hmm. right. So my question is, how can we be conv convinced of something if we don't completely understand it? It seems to me mm -hmm. like that might be a logical contradiction. But mm -hmm. I just wanted if you could clarify that. No, it's a great question. And there's some stuff behind it as well. Uh, as a lot of you would know, the... Uh, determinism or a predestination model, if you want to get in that theology, you know, um, kind of reform thinking and uh, some of that is a massive, massive conversation, discussion, argument that's happening around the evangelical world today. I'll start by telling you where I am inside that and that'll kind of get me over to your point a little bit. In Calvinistic terms, I would be a three and a half point Calvinist. Uh, I absolutely believe in total depravity. Uh, I don't mean believe in it in the sense that I'm for it, just in the sense that, uh, that I absolutely agree that it exists. It's, it's not that I'm, I'm a cheerleader here, you know, for depravity, uh, total depravity. I'm absolutely convinced that uh, uh, irresistible, well, we'll get to that in a second, but that uh, Jesus, um, well, it's total depravity, unconditional divine election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. I can do uh, the idea of the unconditional. I can do the idea of perseverance. Where I get to the limited depends on how you do limited. If you mean that the effect of the atonement is limited to those that trust Christ, I completely agree, or you're a universalist. What I don't agree with is that Jesus intended, the Father intended, to limit the effect of the atonement only to the elect. That would, I just wouldn't be at that point. And I wouldn't be an irres I couldn't do, I can't do irresistible grace. Uh, so I'd be a three and a half point Calvinist in my own position. That would make me different, I understand, than your professors would be at Southern at this point and as regards a lot of things that are behind this. And so relative to the way that you do apologetics, you can be a rationalist, you can be an evidentialist, you can be an empiricist, and you're working off experience, or you can be a fideist. And there's a hard fideist, which is Cornelius Van Til and presupposition, and there's a soft fideist, and that's what I am. And so when I say I'm convinced of something I can't prove, it's because I have a worldview that's behind all of that, that wants to say that relational truth can't be proved, but it can be experienced. I can't prove my wife loves me, but I'm convinced that she does, because I'm in a category of relational context here. And I understand my relationship with God to be more in that context then I understand it to be in a context that, well, is more defined and more determined than that. I believe that, in fact, I would tell you that I'm convinced that the folk that are on our team and our ministry, I'm convinced, are passionately committed to our mission. I could show you all sorts of evidence for that, but I can't prove it. 
and tomorrow they could prove me wrong. And so if you're going to work in a relational context, you're going to either decide, well, you're either going to decide that you are or you aren't. You're only going to become convinced of what you can absolutely prove, in which case you're going to have very little in the world about what you're convinced. Or you're going to decide that I am going to, on a faith presupposition, step past the evidence to a relationship that becomes internally convincing, as it were. That's the two other things. There are some things about experiences that you can't be convinced of unless you're willing to be. If I were skeptical about my wife's love every day for the last 39 years, if she was constantly having to prove to me that she loved me, I'd be less convinced of her love now as a result of the pressure I was placing on her and the way that would be damaging to our relationship. And then the other thing I'd want to come along quickly and add kind of as a footnote to all of that, there's very little in the world about which even empiricists in the most non-theistic categories can prove. They're called axioms. You can't prove that parallel lines never intersect. You'd have to draw them forever. You can't prove that in the calculation of pi, three successive sevens will never appear. They haven't so far been calculated to billions of places, and so far, three successive sevens have never appeared, but you can't prove that they never will. There's a great deal. It's called Bohr's model of complementarity. Does light travel as particle or as wave? By some measuring means, it travels as particle. By others, it travels as wave. Can't be both, but it seems like it is. I had a student in, when I was teaching apologetics at Southwestern that was out of a physics background. He said his professor told them that on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it traveled as particle. On Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, it traveled as wave. And on Sunday, no one was in the lab and it could do whatever it wanted, you know? <laughs> and we're talking about physics here. We're not talking about faith presuppositions in some evangelical context. We're talking about the transmission of light in physics. So if I can't only be convinced of what I can prove, what I'm saying is, Apart from relational or faith context, I'm going to be convinced of very little in the world. Did you prove that those pews would hold you up before you sat in them? Did you test the water system out here before you drank from it? Are you planning to have somebody confirm that your lunch is safe before you eat it? I'm getting ready to get on an airplane. Talk about a religious experience, you know? And then from there, I'm going to drive on the North Dallas Tollway, which is even more of a religious experience. So that'd be my point, is you can be, in a relational context, you can be, I think, convinced of things you can't prove, or else you can almost not, I think, have any relationship on that level. Yeah, it's a big question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yes, um, I was browsing the internet, you know, the source of infinite wisdom. And this person, I was browsing the internet and someone brought up the story of Elijah um, with the Baal worshipers. Oh, yeah. um, you know, whoever's God is real will light fire to this wood. Um, and the person said that was the greatest apologetic and he was wondering why we don't see that used today. By that, the, sign, the signs of wonder apologetic, the miracle? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, it certainly was a miracle, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. When we take people to Israel, we always go up to Carmel and we tell the story. You know, 1 Kings 18, right there. The spring, the only spring in the area is right there. So that's why the Carmelite monastery is there and we're within 50 yards anyway of where this happened. You see that a lot in the Bible. You see a lot of signs and wonders as apologetic. You see the Lord showing up in very obvious, powerful, uh, persuasive ways, right? The whole people saying, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. So why doesn't God do that more, we would ask? Well, a couple of thoughts. First of all, he's doing it more than we may know here. When I go to Cuba, I've been to Cuba a lot over the years. I'm in the New Testament. I'm walking around in the book of Acts. I am meeting people who are experiencing as a regular matter of their lives what we would call divine physical healing. I'm around people that are seeing book of Acts spiritual transformation in their communities. And in their worldview, they assume and expect, not in a presumptuous way, that God is going to work as he worked in Scripture. In our culture, our scientific, anti-supernatural culture, we tend to be less willing to ask him and tend to be less willing to agree when he does. And it's like Spurgeon said, if you pray for rain, you better bring an umbrella, you know? Philip Yancey said, God goes where he's wanted. 
And so I'm not here to say that God no longer does what God did. There are places around the world where people seem to be more open to the miraculous, where they seem to be more praying for, where they seem to be more seeking, seem to be more, um, uh, more uh, expressive of and desirous of, of God working as he did, and he's doing that. So that'd be one thing I would want to say. Second thing I'd want to say is evidences must be interpreted, and they may not be persuasive. It says in one of my favorite verses, oddly enough, in Matthew 28, 17, when Jesus, the risen Christ, is meeting with his disciples, it says that they worshiped him, but some doubted. They're worshiping the risen Christ. Remember earlier in Matthew 28, when the guards go to the authorities and they tell them what's happened with the resurrection, and the authorities make up this story about the disciples stealing the body while they're asleep. Now, if I'm asleep, how do I know who stole the body? If you stole my briefcase from my room last night, but I'm asleep, how do I know who stole it just to begin with, right? But here are the authorities making up an excuse for a miracle. It says in John chapter 12 that after the raising of Lazarus, that the authorities wanted to put Lazarus to death because so many people were turning to Christ. They're face to face with a walking everyday miracle, and rather than repenting in the face of that miracle, they're trying to get rid of the miracle. Now, by the way, I'm not sure they scared Lazarus. He's already been dead once, right? And they come to Lazarus and they say, if you don't shut up, we're going to put you to death. I think Lazarus is saying, make my day, you know? The guy to feel sorry for is Lazarus. He was in heaven and had to come back to earth. I mean, how unfair is that, you know? He's probably up for this, you know? But that's what I'm saying. Even if you had 1 Kings 18 type things all the time, all day, every day, there are a lot of folk in the New Testament that didn't repent when they saw these experiences. Go back and read the book of Revelation, all the judgments that God brings against people, and they gnash their teeth at him rather than repenting. So I think that's the other issue. First of all, we're not praying for it enough, and second, I'm not sure it'd be as compelling as we would think. Yeah. (laughs) And y'all, unless you're clapping for the people asking the question, that's fine, but you know, that's, I'm I'm happy to be here, so yes. Uh Okay. As a little bit of context, I'm a mechanical engineering major at a local university, Uh and I've found that the best way to study is to delete all social media a week prior to my exam. In a society where the biggest place to find your news is on social media, how do high school and college students find a balance between focusing on their studies and uh, watching the news? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I wish you'd ask a practical question, you know? (laughs) And instead of an issue, because no one else has this issue here in this room, right? Nobody, as, as you're all checking your Facebook feeds right now, you know, nobody else has this issue. So we got that, we have a problem. We have a problem. The way that people that make money from social media make money from social media is getting you to be engaged in social media, right? They're not just being your friends here. This is how they make money is on click-throughs and, and screen time and all the stuff that's inside all of that. We're a not-for-profit ministry. If we were for-profit, we'd be even more motivated to try to do all of that because that's how you make money in this business. So you're up against very sophisticated, very sophisticated companies who want you to be even more dominated by your engagement in social media every single day than you already are. Just like we want to sell you more stuff. That's how they're selling you more stuff. And to not be aware of the fact that you are in some sense a target of a very specific, very sophisticated strategy is to not understand it properly. So the fact that you have this opportunity to be so distracted by social media is not because you chose to be that way so much as that's the air you breathe today. The thing to do, I think, this is certainly in my experience the case, and I would say this to you as well, I think that we have to create inside us a kind of technological fasting as a regular spiritual discipline. Now, I don't know how many of you are Baptist. I know this is a Baptist thing, and a lot of you probably are. I've been a Baptist my whole Christian life. I didn't hear much growing up about spiritual disciplines. I didn't hear a lot about solitude. I didn't hear a lot about meditation. And I certainly didn't hear much about fasting. We're in the Lenten season that started last Wednesday. In some more liturgical tradition, there's a fasting regimen that's part of all of this. But in the more evangelical or free church tradition, not as much so. So we're not as comfortable with or at least as familiar with this idea of fasting. Fasting is abstaining from something, you could say, material for the sake of something spiritual. In the Bible, it primarily focuses on fasting from food because in the first century context, that was the primary material distraction. 
You're in a day when there's no food stamps and there's no social safety nets and starvation is a very real possibility. And you're pursuing food on a daily basis. And so to abstain from food was not only a way by which you'd just go hungry, but it, there was some threat in that, depending on where you were on the social ladder. And so fasting from food was a significant way of focusing your heart, kind of like you're doing the week before an exam. You're fasting from, from uh, social media for that purpose. I believe that's something that applies to us in a technology context. In fact, I'll bet you'd have a lot easier time fasting from food for a day than you would fasting from technology for a day. There's an addiction to technology reality of our culture. Try going, try leaving your dorm room or your apartment without your cell phone for a day. And you say, well, I have my Apple Watch. No, I mean, with, leave all of that. Walk through the day without technology and see how it makes you feel. And I'm the same way. On those rare occasions when I leave my phone back at the house as I'm leaving, I go back and I get the phone. And I say, well, I need it to stay in touch because I need to know what's happening in the news because of what I do and all of that. Or we've got kids and grandkids and I want to make sure I stay in touch. And that's true. But I also have a sense that my identity is in some sense connected to my being connected, you know. And so a regular fast for the sake of our souls, a regular fast just to be still and know that he is God and a regular fast to defeat the addiction of this stuff is I think an important prescription. Then the other thing to do, and you know this, but I'll just say it. There is immorality relative to social, uh, social media today that is more enticing and more dangerous than I think you could argue it's ever been. Pornography addiction is a very real thing. Very, very real thing. And I've never met a person who set out to get addicted to pornography. And the way it works from the people that make money doing it is not to start you with hardcore porn. It's to start you with news sites that have suggestive ads that you find yourself going back to. It's to start you with images that are just part of a news feed or part of a news story that you find yourself focusing on the image more than the story. They're getting to the place now. I don't know that they're there yet. They may be, and I just don't know it. But they're getting to the place where the technology can be so invasive that they're able to see what on the screen you're spending the most time looking at and can therefore tailor ad campaigns accordingly. Not just to what you click through, but to what part of the screen, if you're looking at a computer monitor, you're actually focusing on. And so fasting from technology is not just a way of getting away from it for the sake of silence and solitude and being still and knowing that he's God. It's also a thing to be very, very aware. I'm not trying to make you paranoid here, but just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you, you know? <laughs> they're after you. Let me say that. They're after you. They are after you. And so there's a, another level of this, even at that point, I'd want to push at as well. And if you feel like that's an issue for you, if you feel like either addiction to technology or you feel yourself engaged in some pornographic thing or something else that would be immoral on the internet, then the hard thing I have to tell you is to get help now. To get help now. To speak to somebody you trust now. There are ministries that exist specifically in this space because it's such a thing. You wouldn't wait on cancer. Well, this is cancer. You wouldn't try to fix your own broken arm. No shame here. All sin is sin. God loves, God redeems, God's a God of grace. But get help now. Because it'll get worse tomorrow. That's the point. I heard years ago a preacher say something that has stayed with me ever since. Sin will always take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you wanted to pay. Every time. Sin will always take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you wanted to pay. And if right now you're the person thinking you're the exception, you're being lied to. Well, on that happy note, so yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for letting me talk about that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> 
Hi, sir. Thanks How for coming. You? Good. My name Good. is Brennan. And when engaging with family, roommates, friends, etc., I am often confronted with ad, ad hominem and straw man arguments. Um, I'll, I'll let you rephrase those for the audience, but in sake of time, how do you confront someone who is insistent upon responding as such, and how do you graciously and lovingly help them confront their hypocrisy? And say the last part again. Graciously and lovingly. Confront their hypocrisy. Oh, yeah, thank you. You have biblical examples of this issue, don't we? I mean, this is Jesus in Matthew 23 calling the Pharisees hypocrites. And the same Jesus, of course, reaching out to Matthew, the tax collector, and eating at his home and being accused of, and appropriately so, of eating with tax collectors and sinners and all of that. There are times when speaking the truth in love means we have to say very hard things. In fact, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't say this. If I'm your oncologist and I got some bad test results, I would so much rather not tell you that you don't have cancer than to have to tell you that you do. But if I'm a good doctor, I have to tell you that. As a parent, I never used to believe my dad when he said this hurts me more than it hurts you, you know? I used to think that's not true until I became a father. Now that I'm a grandfather, I don't have to do that anymore. I can just spoil him and return him and it's awesome. <laughs> God, grandchildren are God's reward for not killing your kids. I'm just here to tell you. Just hang in there long enough. You'll be glad you had these kids, you know? So, but there are just times when you have to say the hard thing because you love them. But even when you do that, I think you want to earn the right to do it. I think you want to say what my dad said, even if they don't believe you. I'm only saying this because I love you. The reason that I am here to say that same-sex marriage is a bad idea is not because I hate gay people. It's because I love gay people. It's because God has designed us in such a way that living in a gay lifestyle is damaging for us. And we can talk about suicide rates and depression rates and sexual transmission issues and all that's inside that. And you come back and you say, well, that's because we're a homophobic culture. Well, I could take you to Denmark and Sweden, which has been embracive of an LGBTQ lifestyle for 40 years, where you have the same issues relative to suicide and to depression. And I'm not saying that to be unkind. I'm saying what I'm saying because I love you. It'd be so much easier for me not to do that. I'd love not to be branded intolerant. I'd love not to be called a homophobe. I'm only saying this because of love. So if you have to say hard things, you want to make sure your heart's right, first of all. Someone said, beware the person who preached on hell as though he liked it. You know? You want to preach on hell with a tear in your eye. Make sure your heart's right. Ask God to help you have the right heart. And then second, say to the person, I think actually say to the person, I don't want to say this to you. I don't want to have to tell you this. I don't want to have to call out this hypocrisy. I don't want to have to expose this. I'm only doing this because, I, I know you think the opposite, but I'm doing this because I care, and if I didn't, I wouldn't, you know? Then the second thought that comes to my mind is to make certain as I'm doing that, that I'm not doing what I'm accusing him of doing in other ways. I'm not saying you're doing that at all. That's not at all my point. But we tend to see in others the sins that we don't see in ourselves. The old saying is, I will blame you for your for your intentions, excuse me, I, let's see how they do it. I, I, I blame you for your actions, but me for my intentions is the idea. I give me credit for what I meant to do. That's what I'm trying to say. That I wouldn't give you. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I didn't mean for you to take it that way. I may not give you that same credit. I judge me on intention and you on action. That's what I was trying to say. I want to be careful of that. If I see hypocrisy in you, I want to make certain that you don't see it in me. Or if you do, it's not a fair accusation. And then ultimately, it's asking the Holy Spirit to give you the words that you wouldn't have yourself. You know? There's this incredible story. Cory Ten Boom, I don't know if her name's familiar to you at all. Her family was in the Holocaust. She was the only survivor. She wrote a book called The Hiding Place back in the 70s, made into a movie. She's been uh, in heaven for some years now. She was at a place speaking, and one of the prison guards from Ravensbrück, where she was in this concentration camp where her sister starved to death, where Betsy starved to death. Corrie ten Boom is there and she's speaking. And after she, at the conclusion of the event, the service, this former prison guard from Ravensbrück walks up, she recognizes him, and extends his hand and says, thank you, Frau Lein, I am so grateful for your message. And she, who had just been preaching on forgiveness, couldn't take his hand. 
All, all she could think about was her sister and the horrors of those years. And she prayed, Lord, help me love this man. Nothing. Then she prayed again, Lord, give me your love for him. And she said as she took his hand, and electricity flowed through her body she'd never experienced before. It's not Lord help me love so much as it's Lord give me your love. And you can pray that prayer. Yeah. And the more, the harder it is, the more you need to. <laughs> you know. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm going to make this uh, really quick. So yeah. I'm going to yeah, I'm watching the time up there a little bit. We have a little bit of time. So I'm, I'm keeping a, you from lunch, which is a very dangerous thing to do. So, yes. I'm going to make a truth claim that I believe a, a meta narrative on the rise is a belief in nihilism, uh, mostly because a lot of people in my age group have proclaimed belief in such uh, an idea. Uh, and a few have taken it to the extreme by killing themselves. And so, um, based on your idea of using our position and our influence to combat this cultural uh, rise uh, in Western culture, uh, how would we go about doing that for nihilism specifically? No, thank you. No, you're aware of the suicide epidemic today, second leading cause of death among American teenagers. I think that, I believe that's still right, the suicide. And behind some of that is not just the things that have typically been behind suicide decisions. There's an actual meta narrative or worldview called nihilism, or nihilism, which argues that life has no meaning. Life has no purpose. Life has no direction. Martin Heidegger, an existentialist atheistic philosopher, said you're an actor on a stage. You have no script, audience, or director, no past, no future, and courage is to face life as it is. Jean Paul Sartre's most famous book was in, most famous play was entitled No Exit. His autobiography was entitled Nausea. If you go look at the works of Mark Rothko online, who committed suicide, you'll see a nihilistic worldview. The idea that there is no meaning in the world. It doesn't exist. Now the first and therefore, if there's no reason to live, why live? If you have a reason to die, that's good enough because there is no reason, capital R, to live. And so if you have depression or if you are angry at your parents or if you want to get back at your girlfriend or if you just are tired of going on, if you have a reason to die, philosophically speaking, the argument is that's good enough because there is no reason, capital R, objective reason to live. Does that make sense? I hope it doesn't make too much sense, but that's the argument that's here. Well, first of all, on a philosophy level, for me to say that there is no meaning in life is to make a meaning statement, isn't it? We're back to no such thing as truth, and I'm sure of it. That's the first thing we're doing here. I'm arguing for objective meaning and claiming there is no objective meaning. That's the first thing here. Now, that's not going to be persuasive, but it's an important point to make. The second thing to get to, when a person is attracted to a nihilistic worldview. At least in my experience and in my reading as well, there's always a backstory. If you look at Heidegger's life, if you look at Jean-Paul Sartre's life, some of the folk that I've known that have been expressing nihilism, there's a backstory. There's, there's something you don't know. And it's not philosophical. It's not logical. It's personal. And nihilism gives them a way to feel justified in deciding that the world has no meaning because for them it doesn't. And it gives them a way of feeling that it's not their fault that they can't find meaning in the world if there's no such thing as meaning in the world. And the thing I want to do with that is spend less time on the philosophical argument and more on the backstory. And even if I can't get that person in the next 10 minutes to agree with me that they've adopted an illogical, self-contradictory worldview to begin with, and that there's always a backstory in others, I want to see what I can do in their own story. At least to give them reason, small r to live, 
if they don't believe there's reason capital R to live, at least give them small r reason to live while we're having this conversation going forward. It could be a spiritual warfare issue we're dealing with as well. So, but this nihilistic worldview is unfortunately becoming more, as you know, more pervasive today. I just myself believe there's usually a backstory behind the people that are attracted to it. Yeah. I'm glad you're concerned about that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. You bet. You bet. And it's 1227, so I know we're up against a little bit of time. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, Anna, I think I got Thanks, healed when, with everybody I was in line when you was talking with every issue everybody had. Hmm. But what my question is, yeah. uh, the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus' ministry, I've raised in the Baptist church all of my life. My daddy was a preacher. He What's baptized like? me, kept me in the water a long time. Your dad, was, <laughs> your dad was a preacher and you survived. Look at this. I survived. Wow. Because you I've really always, look like you, you know, you made it through. And yeah. I've always wondered, who, who, what am I supposed to be doing? Mm. So I started out doing the things that Jesus did. Okay. Wanted everybody to be well. Even through college, I'm a social worker. Oh. Most of my friends, they want the religious part, the mm -hmm. songs, the, but we never go out. Yeah. I go out and it's a lonely Good for you. place to be. Yeah. So I'm 71 years old, so I had to come to the realization <laughs> it's all about Jesus. That's right. And spending more time with him. Amen. So I thank God for the BCM at mm -hmm. East Arkansas Community College that I connected with. Amen. That empowered me, and I tutor there. Not no. smart in the books, no. but I tell them this. If I did it, you can do it. There you go. Young people know technology. Mm -hmm. I'm learning it. And I tell them, y'all got Google, YouTube. <laughs> I read books and highlight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all are marvelous. Yeah. Use those tools. You have to get off of Facebook. <laughs> because when you get hooked on that, you're going to forget about what you're supposed to be. Yeah. So uh, I'm honored to, even, Good to be here because of BCM. Yeah. I'm honored, we are, and we are honored that you are here. That is awesome. Okay, so I'm going to say this real quickly because I know time's an issue. So you and I have inherited a Greco-Roman world, right? goes back to, well, Plato, Aristotle, all that. Uh, in their worldview, you have the secular and you have the spiritual. There was a thing called the Orphic cult six centuries before Christ that said your soul existed in a pre-incarnate state. It's sin, we would say. It was punished by being put in your body. And the point of life is to purify your soul so that when you die, it can go back where it came from. Well, that was just kind of a crazy idea, but it influenced Pythagoras, who influenced Plato, who influenced the whole Western world, so that you and I breathe air that says there's secular and there's spiritual and there's Sunday and there's Monday and there's religion in the real world. And you want a transactional religion where you place offerings on the altar so that God will bless your crops or whatever. Go to church on Sunday so God will bless you on Monday. Have a quiet time so God will bless your day. And what she just said was all of that's a lie. What she just said was that God's Lord of Monday too. And God has just as much passion for what you do Tuesday night as what you do on Sunday morning. And there is no spiritual secular division in the Bible. When God made the whole thing, he called it good. And so to be that passionate about your social work call and about your tutoring as you are on your worship is worship. And if more of us would be like that, the world would be better. That's really cool. So, yes, ma'am. Hi. So um, I'm only a junior in high school, so it's my first time kind of being in really intelligent conversations like this. Well, you know. <laughs> That's very kind. She's, she'll grow out of that. She'll get older. She'll figure that out. So, you know. Yeah. But that, that, thank you anyway. Yes. Um, but I was wondering, uh, especially if you're not quite sure if that's going to be like the profession or calling you're going into, how do you set up um, or have the discipline to like have such a sophisticated or articulate view of Christianity instead of like a large portion of the church that's just kind of there on Sundays to like how do you um, what do you do to make that more mature and deep wow that's a great Bruce did you pay her to ask that question man <laughs> wow what a f closing question that's that's awesome. All right, time-wise, time I'll try to do this uh, quickly. In uh, philosophy, we talk about how you know what you know. It's called epistemology, all right? And there are three ways you know what you know. Rational, practical, intuitive. You do math rationally, 
You start your car practically. You like people intuitively. Now, we all do all three, but one tends to dominate our personality, and one tends to dominate our churches. Most Baptist churches, in my experience, and I say this kindly, I've been a Baptist minister my whole ministerial life, tend to be very practical, very pragmatic, very how-to-ish. There tends to be the intuitive part of that in the worship experience. The rational side of this, the loving God with all your mind, tends to be less emphasized. In fact, we can be accused in some ways of being somewhat anti-intellectual. If you just had enough faith, you wouldn't have those questions. Mark Knoll years ago wrote the book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, and the scandal is we don't have one. Kind of the park your brain at the door. If you had enough faith, you wouldn't have those doubts. Well, ask Thomas that. Ask Jesus on the cross that, right? So the first thing to do is to embrace the fact that you're called to love God with all your mind. Embrace that fact. The loving God with your heart, soul, mind strength is all one thing. That Jesus is our model when he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. That's the first thing I would think. Second thing is find good mentors. Now, some of your best mentors aren't walking around on the planet anymore. Something like 92% of the world population isn't walking around on the planet right now, you know? Chesterton said one of the great egotisms of our day is to believe we're the only people that know anything. And so some of your best mentors are going to be in print or on your iPad or whatever, but they're going to be people that are going to guide you along the way. I'd be looking for a present tense mentor to give me some guidance in those contexts. Whether that's a student minister, that's a pastor, that's somebody at a college, that's a friend, I'd be praying for that. Lord, would you guide me to somebody who will mentor me in this way, who will show me what I ought to be reading, who will help me to know what kind of processes I can put myself through so that I can acquire some discipline around all of this and ask a mentor to guide you with that. And he will do that. He will absolutely do that. And then the last thing that I would say is not to be discouraged. I tried to say before, the Holy Spirit has a strange affinity for the trained mind. I'm absolutely convinced myself. That's part of the reason I wanted to come today and be part of this when Bruce asked. I'm convinced that you have an opportunity. It's going to sound like I'm being patronizing. You have an opportunity. Your generation, this current context, has an opportunity on an intellectual level to make the case for Christianity with a global impact we've never seen before. You right now, through communicational technology, through what you post on your Facebook, what you put in your Twitter stream, can reach more people than most writers across all of history have ever been able to reach. That's just the nature of the digital platform that exists right now. You have an opportunity to communicate, to speak the truth in love on a level that has just never been available before. You have an intuitive understanding of how to do that that people my age just don't. We have 35 people on our staff at our ministry, and 30 of them are millennials and younger. And there are five of us that are the old people walking around, you know? So grateful. All that to say, I want to encourage and endorse what you ask and urge you, if you don't have a theological mentor, an intellectual mentor, to ask God for that. C.S. Lewis, more than any other person, has been that for me. Um, I'll tell this and be done. Uh, my father uh, fought in World War II and never went to church again. He saw horrible atrocities and never went to church again. So I grew up in a loving home but no spiritual life and all my dad's questions. If there's a God, why is there war, science and faith, evil and suffering, all that. Got invited to church when I was 15 by some friends. I eventually became a Christian but still had all these questions and thought there was just something wrong with me. I was a kid in Sunday school asking, how do we know the Bible's true, and why is Jesus the only way, and what about Buddhists? And I just got the impression there was something wrong with my faith. Then someone gave me mere Christianity. I still have that $1.95 as it was back then book on my shelf. First time I'd seen anyone deal with faith intellectually. And he, I still read from him every day. I read from him this morning. I've given lectures on his life. I've been to his place in the kilns a bunch of times. He just has, to me, been a, a real mentor, you know? I'm not recommending him necessarily to you. I would think you might look that direction and see. Mere Christianity is pretty old now. It's 70 years old, and some of it's not as relevant as it used to be, but uh, he might be a, a place to go. There, there, there will be others. 
But if you don't have a theological intellectual mentor, let me encourage you at that point. And then let me encourage you to be one of those. The best way to learn is to teach. The best way to, uh, to make progress is to invite others to make progress with you. And so, uh, and you are by no means too young, by no means too young to be somebody at that point. My first intellectual mentor was my youth minister who was in college when I was in high school and was the first person to challenge me to take the Bible seriously and to read the Bible with some kind of a systematic approach. First person to do that was a college student who challenged me and I'll, know, I'm, I'll always be grateful. So as you move forward in that direction, loving God with all your mind, you can't measure the eternal significance of present faithfulness. You cannot know what God's going to do in the future with your faithfulness in the presence. You just can't. And so let's just celebrate that and be grateful. Thank you so much. You. Yeah, you bet. You bet. All right, Bruce. The most dangerous place to be in a Baptist church is between Baptists and food. That's been my experience. That's exactly it, yeah. Hey, would you one more time thank Dr. Oh. Dennison for coming and being here?